Did you ever have the feeling that everyone was against you? Most of us in our daily lives feel that we are outsiders, that we are alone against the world. For one young man in 1866, this paranoia would become reality when he returned home, only to find barbarians and cowards. But just who is this prodigal son? Why has he come back? How will he deal with these invaders? And the most important question of all, just what is the meaning of Hey guys, Ruby the Rager, hope you're having a fantastic day, and welcome to the first episode of The Meaning Of. In this series, I aim to explore the major themes and minor morals that make up our media. This series is not meant to be a review, and as such, I will withhold any sort of rating or critique of the subject matter. Before we dissect the episode proper, a small preface is in order to give some needed background into The Rebel, otherwise known as... Johnny. Johnny? Johnny. The Rebel was a two-season Western serial running from 1959 to 1961. The story begins a year after the end of the American Civil War and features a range of characters that Johnny Yuma, played by Nick Adams, finds himself encountering on his travels. Being an ex-Confederate soldier that still wears most of his uniform, Johnny Yuma finds himself occasionally accosted by bitter Southerners and vengeful Northerners. In between episodes of his sometimes reluctant heroism, Johnny Yuma aspires to being a writer and uses his adventuring as inspiration for his journal, which he always keeps close at hand in his saddlebag. And just in case you forgot his name or the setup of the show, the introduction of the show had a memorable and informative theme song, as most serials do. Johnny Yuma was a rebel he roams through the west Did Johnny Yuma, the rebel He wandered alone We open with several papers disheveled on the ground. <laughs> Johnny Yuma defends himself against any attack out on the trail. He makes sure to collect these papers, what we find out later to be his journal, before heading into town. The town, we learn, is Johnny's home. The prodigal son returns in search of his father. Since he is suffering from signs of heat exhaustion, Johnny cools himself with a quick trip to a horse trough. Hey, you, Reb. Hey, you, Reb. This here water's for horses. It ain't for no jackass. I come here to water my horse. And you do that. Well, not with your face in I don't want him contaminated. Don't push. Push? Well, Reb, you ought to be used to being pushed. Well, we push you clear from Gettysburg through Georgia. You gotta admit, you've been pushed real good. Yeah. The war's done. So it is. But... <laughs> I'm not... Yeah, I'm gonna enjoy pushing you pretty good. Push you? <laughs> push? How you done it, Fred? <laughs> While dunking his head, he is taunted by a standard dim-witted heavy. At first, Johnny ignores him, but after being figuratively and literally pushed, Johnny fights back. This helps explain the introduction of the show, Johnny fighting the Indians as he is both soldier and scholar. The Indians had pushed him just as the ruffian was pushing him now. We will see this conflict reach its inevitable conclusion once Johnny converses with the rest of the town. Hey, Jess. Jess! The first person he comes across while searching for his father is the deputy, Jess. Uh, uh, My pa out of town? He comes back and finds you like this, you're gonna be in deep trouble. Uh, Jess, it's me, Johnny! Jess! Johnny. Well, I ain't never seen you pie-eyed before. Come on, let's get some coffee in you and get this place straightened up before pa gets back. Johnny, you should come back sooner. What's wrong with you? 
At first, he is surprised at Johnny's return, but quickly tries to deflect as Johnny inquires about his father. Where's my pa? Oh, Johnny. Yes, where's my pa? The transition here is a recurring theme in the editing of the series, as scenes are often strung together with match cuts, punctuating sentences. Did they shoot him in the back? They didn't have to. There was enough of them in front of him. Was he alone? Why was he alone? When pressed on the issue, Jess admits that he, along with the rest of the town, let the elder Yuma face the bandits alone. Jess deflects and turns the question around on Johnny, asking where he has been since the war ended one year prior. The deputy justifies this by saying that the bandits didn't fight fair. There was no honorable duel, no draw at high noon, just a lone sheriff ambushed on the street. Where were you, deputy? Where were you, Johnny? The war's been over for more than a year. Has it? Well, there's different kinds of wars. There's wars that don't end just because a white flag goes up. Somebody signs a piece of paper. There's wars that go on inside. If the sun hadn't been in my eyes, he'd have never got that first one across. I'm gonna put six slugs right through his brisket. Is that before he gets your eyeballs? Huh? Uh... Sure you will, Black. Sure. You better believe it. He was lucky. I'm gonna kill him. Bart. We pull away from Johnny for a moment as we see the bandit that heckled him hanging around the general store with the others. He claims the only reason Johnny beat him earlier was due to the sun being in his eyes. This, paired with the death of Johnny's father, tells us he and his ilk are nothing but bullies. When they're in control, they are quite content, but when they are humbled by an equal or greater force, they call foul. One could see them, ironically, as an allegory for the Confederacy and the soon-to-come Lost Cause mythos. In this scene, we see the bandit leader harass the store owner for more provisions. As with any bully, capitulation only prolongs the inevitable. Uh, yeah, beg pardon, Mr. Pierce, but uh, we're about out of provisions. So get some more. Well, well it's the money. Uh, I'm all out. You, you promised me money that you'd pay for all this, and... Well, I've spent all I had, and if you just... Uh... I just bet five more. Your credit's good at the store. The store owner's wife, a woman we learn in this scene is Johnny's aunt, attempts to defend her husband, to which the bandit leader reminds her that she was so much a coward that she did not even attend Sheriff Huma's funeral. Mr. Pierce, I... I think that you... Miss been... Emmy! You didn't even go to your own brother's funeral. No. Bart back here tells me he's liable to have to kill your nephew, too. The only reason she wants to fight back now is because the situation is directly impacting her. This is in both reference and opposition to Johnny's code of ethics, as he minds his own business, but will intervene should a situation become untenable. Although in the aunt's case, she reacts purely for selfish reasons. Mr. Dodson? Hello, John. You turn it out like the rest of them? I'm just a small businessman going out of business. We catch up with Johnny just as he catches up with Mr. Dodson, the local newspaper man. He's fleeing the town, acting as many other reputable citizens have done up to this point. You and Pa, you were the two people I... John, I loved your father like my own brother. But I'm not anxious to join him. I'm sorry if that sounds cruel or cowardly. But the things you wrote... That's mostly what set me off to reading and wondering. Johnny admits that Mr. Dodson inspired him to be a writer, and to see him running away hurts Johnny deeply. Although he's hurt, Johnny does not get overly emotional, only sorrowful. He keeps an even temper in most conversations, as if sparing others the righteous condemnation he has found himself capable of during the war. Johnny comes to his aunt looking for the truth. He wants to know why even his family wouldn't stand up for what was right. His aunt belittles his father as a fool that got himself killed. She uses this as a shield against criticism of her own cowardice. We've just been trying to keep things going. We're, we're trying to keep the town together. After all, somebody's got to show some sense. Sense! You trying to make sense with the ones who killed your own brother? Just because my brother was a fool doesn't mean the rest of us don't have to go on living. 
He let himself be goaded into being shot dead. Your father was a fool, Johnny. Don't talk about my father. What did he ever do for you? When Johnny objects to the name calling of his father, he himself is challenged on the runaway attempts of his youth and joining the war, both seemingly to get away from his father. Why did you run away a dozen times before you were 15 years old? Why did you go to war? To fight for a cause? Why, you didn't know what a cause was. It was just another kind of running away. Well, why don't you keep on running? All you can do around here is make trouble for the rest of the town. You don't care about the rest of the town. I came here to help you, Johnny. You're just thinking about yourself and your bootlicking husband. Oh, all you Yumas, you hold your nose when Zecker walks by because you can't stand the smell of good sense. This is the writer's way of establishing Johnny's motives. Why does he want to make a stand here and now? The simple answer is revenge. The better answer is justice. But the real answer is pride. With his father gone, the Confederacy destroyed, and his hometown disgraced by cowardice, all Johnny has left is his pride. While not fighting for any particular creed, Johnny does have a classical Southern honor code. He fought the war for personal reasons, and when his efforts were not rewarded, it demanded of him an introspection of his own beliefs. Who he is without the uniform, without the army, without the South. He fights not for what's right, but only for what's fair. He lives as a contrarian not out of spite for the world, but love for his fellow man. This is what makes him our titular character, the Rebel, because he rebels against the lawless and senseless violence of the West. That's the way it is, Johnny. You can't fight him. You can't even do business with him. We're, uh, all of us changed, Johnny. Mostly me. They called me down and I ran. I ran right for a bottle. I got no right wearing a badge. It's just got too heavy for me since they killed your father. Jess, I'm getting awful sick of your whimpering and belly aching. Quit following me around like some puppy dog. You're supposed to be a man. When he sees the bandit leader toss Zecker out into the street, Johnny takes up his father's six-shooter, coldly scolding the cowardly deputy as he does. I've been reading over my old editorials. It may be that a man who listens to himself is twice a fool, but I'm staying. Probably just long enough to write my own obituary, but I can still pull a trigger, and I think I can fix that press. Thanks, Mr. Thompson, but there's more around here needs fixing than that press. What can we do? You already did. Now please just stay inside someplace. On his way to deal with the bandits, Mr. Dodson tells Johnny he is with him, to which Johnny shoots him off. Johnny fights his battles alone. Rarely does he allow others to aid him. Hey, boys, looky. Here comes that big, brave soldier boy again. And he got his daddy's gun on. He wants to die like his daddy did. And you're gonna be by your daddy's side, sonny, unless you keep on going right out of town. <laughs> Bart, the bandit that had pushed Johnny earlier, heckles him from the saloon door again and again, but Johnny ignores him. Tompkins, I want the key to that room. Ben? What's he gonna do in there? I don't know. But I'm not gonna ask him.
Johnny enters the back room of the general store, and when he re-emerges, he carries with him a lit bundle of dynamite. He uses the resulting explosion to flush the bandits out of the saloon, where he attempts to shoot them down with his six-shooter, only to find it empty. This subverts expectations established by other Western media, where the hero quick draws and guns down the bad guy with ease. The Rebel, being a more grounded series, means that our hero is going to get hurt, get mad, get sad, and sometimes even suffer Pyrrhic victories. In this case, Johnny gets lucky, as the deputy tosses him a scattergun, which Johnny uses to finish off the bandits. This will become his iconic weapon going forward, as is a perfect representation of Johnny Yuma, the man that bucks tradition. Where a Wyatt Earp, or Trinity, or Hickok would be fast on the draw with a six gun, Johnny Yuma ensures victory through his cunning use of strategy and two smoking barrels. He did not rally the townspeople, beat the bandits in a draw, or have pitched gun battles along the street, as had been seen in films like High Noon. Which is Dow's horse? Over there. I figure I got this much coming. Johnny. I... Am I saddle across the street? Johnny, why don't you stay? When asked to stay, he refuses, insisting on traveling the West so that he might have real experiences to write about. Johnny Yuma is the rebel, not because he upholds the peace, but rather because he keeps the conscience of his fellow man. He must judge others and hold them accountable for the good or ill they have done. I don't suppose you want that job now. Well, thanks, Mr. Dotson. Changed my mind. Things I gotta learn aren't here. It's just another stopping off place. I know that. You're gonna try to keep writing? I'll try to while I keep going. I'd like to send you what I put down from time to time. Maybe, maybe you can keep it and help me fix it up later. I'd like to do that, son. You've got a lot to see. I think one day you'll have a lot to say. But you can't write it unless you've lived it. Maybe that was my mistake. Where do you go? Here and there, doesn't matter. Johnny, it was your pause. This moral yardstick is formed from the regrets of a soldier, the hopes of a poet, and the shared wisdoms of man. In short, that is the meaning of Johnny Yuma. That is it for this video. I hope you guys enjoyed, and if you did, then do the usual. Like, subscribe, check out my streams, and I will see you guys in the next video. Reaper the Rager, signing off.